When you make a movie, when you make a television show, you kind of create a Frankenstein. It's way bigger than you, and it is terrifying. And that movie or that TV show is threatening to destroy your life and your happiness at all times. Hi, I'm Raihan Salam. This week, Vice meets Jay Duplass and Mark Duplass, the creators of HBO's Togetherness. What are your fantasies? If you could do whatever you want, what would you do to Brett? Make him lose control. Yeah, yeah, Spontaneous yeah. and crazy. I just want to punch him in the face. Thanks very much for joining me, guys. Thank you for having us. Yes. Togetherness is what is known as a TV show. Mm, television uh, program. Yet, yet you guys, you guys are not exactly TV show makers. You no. guys are filmmakers. What was the thought process behind it? It, it was honestly the idea, uh, you know, we're in our late 30s, we had young children. We were getting our asses kicked by said young children, uh, despite the fact that everyone thought we were super happy. We were just getting crushed, waking up at night, changing diapers. And, I, and all of our friends who were in the same position were just hating on their lives and secretly hiding it, because you can't talk about that when you have a beautiful, healthy family. Uh, and then our single friends who were you know, secretly wishing that they had our lives were sort of like, desperate and terrified that they were gonna die with their music in them. And we kind of like felt like there was this weird like critical mass of desperation approaching the age of 40, uh, living on the east side of Los Angeles on the fringe of Hollywood, one foot in, one foot out. Brett, I I'm getting evicted. I can't take skinny, beautiful LA people looking at me like I'm a whale. I don't think everybody thinks you're a whale. People look at me, man, they want to harpoon me. The stories kept coming in and they were tragic and they were funny and that's what Mark and I love to do. And there were so many of them that it just felt like more than a movie. It felt like a television show, in particular the ones that HBO does. And it kind of felt like the, the same way it felt when we made our first feature, The Puffy Chair. I love you and I want you to come with me. You guys seem to be on this road trip, and it seems to be about you guys connecting. But at the very same time, dude, well, I'd love to go with you. We were in our mid-20s, we were living in Brooklyn. Different crisis, earlier crisis. Same yeah. shit, though. It was like everyone was in that spot where they were dating someone for three or four years, and they're like, okay, either we're gonna get married, or if I'm not married, I better break up with this motherfucker right now because I don't want to waste my good years on him. Um, that was that was the soup of our lives then. Um, and we haven't made anything as deeply personal since the puffy chair. And, and we felt ourselves, I guess for the first time, truly in a new life station and with endless stories to tell. So we, it felt like the right time. What I love about this being a TV show is that with the films, you have these characters, they have their arc. And in a way, with the puffy chair, here's a movie where you have these guys, you know, this guy in this crisis, this girl in this crisis, and then they go on a kind of picaresque adventure and things kind of happen. Whereas here, it seems more like the characters, you can give them the time and space to kind of keep having this kind of combustible reaction. Is that the thing that made the TV? Yeah, that's a big part of it. I mean, a, a huge part of television, especially long form serial television and the way that people are creating it now is the way we've been talking about it, it's an open universe. You know, when you make a feature film, it's closed. You, you're doing the first 10 minutes and you're already thinking about how you're gonna pay off those things and how they're gonna end and the audience is too. But in television, it just keeps going and there's less artifice to the form, to be completely honest about it. You know, the, the emotional arcs shift and change uh, just like they do in real life. You don't have to close them. Emotional arcs don't close in real life. Plots, things that happen in your life open and close and so we've just found that the form is incredibly well suited to what we do, which is basically documentary ver verite style filmmaking. You're talking about these different kinds of desperation. There's the single desperation, and then you have the, the kind of weird desperation where you're in a marriage, and yet you still feel isolated. Where are you going? You going out? No. Why are you all dressed up? What's going on? No. I made you a drink. Where is everybody? They are gone. And we are going to try something different. Well, okay. This is a nice surprise. There's the couple of Michelle and Brett. I play Brett on the show. You know, he's, he's in this place where, like, he's got a decent job. He's got beautiful kids. He's been married to the same person for over 10 years. They're, they're doing great. But what happens when you're a couple um, is 
you end up looking out at your kids when you have kids and you just stare at them and you try and wipe their shit and deal with everything that's happening. And then at a certain point, they kind of get to a little breaking point where it's a little bit on its feet and you take a breath and you go, thank God that's over. And then you turn and you look at each other and you don't recognize each other anymore. And you don't know what you want or what they want. And a lot of times I've seen that relationship on film and, and they just sort of like fade away from each other. But what I love about Brett and Michelle is like, they're actually pretty smart, pretty emotionally evolved. They love each other and they're trying to get back to each other and they don't know how to do it. They try is, to be kind to each other. They try yeah. to be generous to yeah, each other. Yeah, which is terrifying. And also in our opinion, or maybe just our strange sensibility, kind of makes us giggle for some reason. People that desperately trying to do things and failing at them <laughs> is something that we are experts at, <laughs> yeah. um, and we like to see other people do it, it's too. Really, it's really, it's comforting for us, I guess. Yeah. And, you know, Michelle in particular, and this was brought to life truly by, by Melanie Linsky, is, is, is almost an archetype that we're looking to subvert. Hey, what are you doing? What the fuck's going on? Are you jerking off? Are you? Uh, Am I what? Are you whacking jerking off? Jerking off? Whacking off? That's why you have to be so gross. Shh. Fuck. I thought, I thought you were taking a nap in here. You're having a fucking a was... fuck fest by yourself? What is this? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, okay? I, th I thought maybe I would take a nap. I just. Because, you know, nap time is a little valuable. I would have liked to have been working out while you. Okay, I'm what, sorry. What are you. What are you... What you, I came in here and I was reading and... What are you fiddling with under the covers? What are you squirming and you're playing with your boobs? I don't I'm not playing, I'm not, I'm just... Clothespins? Of the put-upon housewife who hasn't had a chance to follow her dreams. Um, but once uh, that pin gets pulled for her, more comes out than you might imagine. She also has a kind of aggression that I think unfolds that's really we, amazing. We and call her the mouse that roared, uh, and that's how we labeled that character, and we're very excited about her. And then in terms of the, uh, the other two in the house, um, Amanda Peet uh, plays a character named Tina, who is uh, also pushing 40, has really skated by on her looks and her charm her whole life, and is now realizing she hasn't landed that dude that she thought she might, um, and she's not going to be able to get by on her looks anymore, and she has developed zero skill sets. Do you know what it's like to not have found anyone at my age? There's nobody left. I'm just going to end up alone and like a freak, like Aunt Edie. Just fake it. Do you see the smile? Yeah. I'm dead inside. It's getting her into this really exciting place of what she could become, redefining yourself and who you could be at 40. On a good morning, feels exciting. On a bad morning, it's potentially tragic. Um, so that's a very dynamic and kind of explosive character. She might be our most dynamic character. Mm -hmm. And Alex is um, played by Steve Zissis, who Mark and I went to You've high school forever, with. You've known him forever, yeah. We, yeah. I, so everything, you know what I mean? What? All sports. For real, what were you good Football, at? Football, baseball, basketball. Really? President of my school. Were you president of your school? The lead in all the plays. You were president I of was, your school. Remember the Billie Jean video with Michael Jackson? Like, literally, like, I would like walk and like the sidewalk would just like light up, like gold light. And girls were just like, oh, wow. What were they like? Basically, you know, Steve is the most autobiographical character we've ever created. He created the show with us. You know, the, his character is really based on his life, which is when we were in high school, he was the president of our high school. Everyone in New Orleans who knew this guy was like, he's going to be the next Tom Hanks or the next president or pull a Ronald Reagan and do both. <laughs> and, and we were like, okay, we can't wait to see what happens. And Mark and I have stood by and watched him struggle as an actor. He's, I mean, you know, we've written a lot of stuff with him in it. He's kind of like weirdly our, our like chubby Greek muse. You guys both direct and you kind of both act, but there are a lot of times when you've been directing your brother. Yeah. And one thing that I've noticed is that earlier in Mark's career as an actor, he often played this kind of alpha male gone to seed kind of character. See, you're like cute. Sweet, nice. Why do women start that way and then just turn into passive aggressive, conniving? You're playing a very what? different kind of character who's like weirdly kind of tight. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious for you, like your perspective on your brother's evolution this way or kind of, you know, how that panned out or is that something that's kind of drawing on changing life experience? It's interesting because we don't necessarily like pick a character and say we want to do it. I, it seemed to be the right fit for the story to have Brett be completely locked up. And like you said, we love the concept that 
Alex weirdly provides the space for Brett to like uncrunch a little bit. So I think it was more a function of the relationships. I mean, it's all alchemy that we don't totally understand to be completely honest. But you know, um, it's fascinating to us that like Alex can afford to give Brett the space and to give him all the time and space he needs because Alex doesn't have anything going on in his life. And that creates almost like a soulmate-ish relationship with Alex and Brett. I think we've had enough of those. Please, I don't, don't give me a vegan lecture. I don't want to hear about a food documentary, okay? Let me just enjoy this right now. I'm just trying to help. This is tough love time. Give me the fucking donuts. You want the donuts? Yeah, I want the donuts. All right. You can have them. Thank you. You just did that right to my face. Right in your face. All right. Throw to my donuts! Give me the... Give it to me. Give, give me the... Bag it. All right, you see? You're a mess. Look at me. All right, you got a little bit right here. Just what must bit. it mean for Michelle that her husband's soulmate is his best friend from high school <laughs> and, and, and their relationship has outspanned hers by th two decades? You know what I mean? It's and very he's hard. he's kind of happier when he's with He's Alex kind right of now. happier, and it's kind of undeniable. The kind of improvisational process that you guys use, you know, seems to have turned out really beautifully um, with this cast, it seems like everyone, it seems to have worked quite well. Is there, has there ever been a time when it hasn't worked in yeah, quite there, the right way? There have been very few instances where, you know, some people are just not comfortable with it. And, and let me explain, it is not comfortable to sit in a world of chaos. I mean, people love it, we love it, because it provides a sense of anything could happen in this moment, a sense of documentary realism that you just can't have unless the set is truly a dangerous place, where anyone can walk in and do or say anything that they want. And there are some actors who just believe that script is God and they need that benchmark, and they're just even not- Even if you're gonna play with it, even if you're gonna like, but they want that they structure. They want that structure and and you know it's it's tough and we've gotten better at figuring out who's gonna work out and who's not and in general too there are actors who have never done it before but if they want to do it and they're excited to jump off of that cliff it almost always works and you have it always people. works when they it want always work. works and it's you're kind of directing like you kind of in a way because you guys are directing together but you're also to some degree guiding it as 100% one one from inside of the scene but Steve, Melanie, Amanda own these characters and they're so goddamn smart I mean that I can't underestimate the obviously they're great actors they inhabit the roles really well but they're incredibly loving and they're incredibly smart and those two qualities are so important when we are casting people you know is their ability to navigate these situations and more importantly just be kind-hearted sweet loving people I think the the kindness you're talking about in that show some of that is top-down stuff from us but it's it's very much infused from the casts so Transparent has been insanely well received mm -hmm. and you're acting in it and you're one of the leads. Did you kind of want like, hey, like let me kind of be in the limelight a little bit and like, you know, do this thing? I have to tell him. No. Yes. Allie's crazy. Tell me what? Dad is a woman. Does mom know? Of course I know that. You think I'm a dummy? It's his thing. It's his little private kink. Everyone has one. Right, Rabbi? Uh, well, I guess everyone has, you know, one or two. Honestly, uh, even when we were coming up making DIY stuff, it was never a question of me to be in front of the camera because I have always been the camera operator on the stuff that we've done. This show on HBO is the first time I have an operated camera. Uh, really? So, yeah, I mean, I, I am literally the A camera operator on every movie that we've made. Uh, and it's been a big part of our process where I'm up in the stuff with people and literally whispering to them during a take. and. Me being in it and Mark watching on monitors or Mark acting and me being right there with him has been a kind of integral part of our process. So this is totally new to me and totally a fluke that I got put in this show because I was simply trying to help Jill Soloway cast the role of my character at a director's party. I wonder, just your brothers who love each other and work together, are your parents thrilled? Are they like insanely proud of you and happy just that you get along? So you well? have no idea. <laughs> the only thing that I can say is and I, is that every little brother wants to hang out with his big brother, um, and ninety nine point nine nine percent of the big brothers are just like fuck off, get out of here. <laughs> and Jay always included me in that stuff, and always brought me along. And and when he learned how to work the camera, he let me like. 
be a part of it and carry the VCR, and then he let me act in the movies. But then this shift happened where Jay went to college when he was 18, I was 14. Um, and, and he was so supremely like my god and my leader. And, and he got really lonely and, and started calling home. And I was like, he needs me. For the first mm -hmm. time, like I have an opportunity here to be this person that he has always been for me. So I would like fly up to Austin and drive out there constantly through high school. And that's kind of where you so got started as filmmakers too in Austin. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and then since then we've kind of we have this push and pull because we've each been in the leadership role in our relationship. So we walk on a set in the morning, and I I look at Jay and he looks at me, and in about two seconds we know who's feeling less depressed, more confident, more ready to kind of lead the troops. And that person leaves the room about a step ahead of the other person, and they are more confidently talking to the crew members. And, and everybody understands this about us. And then the person behind that person tends to be a little quieter and a little more perceptive about what's actually going on. And they end up having like the two or three creative breakthroughs of the day because they're a little more wallflowery. And that's kind of our rhythm. It matters a lot for you guys to be able to work together smoothly. Yeah. So, like, you know, how 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 has that worked out? You know, you have to take it back to the fact that when we were in our twenties, we were banging our heads up against the wall, making bad art, and just desperate to find something that we could contribute to this world. And we did not think we were going to make it. And the fact that we did find our voice, the fact that Sundance celebrated us and festivals around the world celebrated us, we still can't believe it. So we are coming from this unbelievably brotherish caveman underdog aesthetic. And so we So there's feel, still the it's us against the oh world. Oh god, like, it is. Yeah. And 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 one hundred percent. And that's that might just be a mentality that we'll never get over because of poverty consciousness. But one thing that is creative poverty. Yes. <laughs> creative poverty. Yeah. One thing is that it is true is when you make a movie, when you make a television show, you kind of create a Frankenstein. It's way bigger than you, and it is terrifying. And that movie or that TV show is threatening to destroy your life and your happiness at all times. You've probably talked to a lot of directors. Most directors, by the time they're 40, are fucked in the head. They're a little crazy. It's a lot for one human being to tackle. It's also so much control. There's something kind of fascinating yeah. about that. Who gravitates to this work where you're kind of... Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that also plays into it because we have a very, very different approach. We wanted to be the Coen brothers and control everything. We got our asses kicked. We are probably the, the most lenient directors out there, and we are really trying to foster a moment on set where lightning can strike and the most inspired version of our script can happen right then and there. And that helps us in terms of not trying to exact a perfected vision that we've like separately concocted. Oh, it's different from what you thought. No, we're actually... The lightning strikes, and it's not just Mark and me. Everyone on set is like, oh my God, it happened. Were there any shows that influenced you or films or anything? Was there something that kind of informed the aesthetic or something that had a, a, you know, just a big influence on you when you were younger? There was never uh, a television show that made us feel like we want to move into TV. I mean, certainly um, it's no secret of you know, the, the sort of uh, recent boon in TV and, and all the great creative stuff you can have there, that we were aware of that. But mostly what brought us to it was um, this idea of togetherness felt bigger than just a movie. Um, and then what suddenly dawned on us when we got in there was like the simple mathematics of in a movie you set up for about 30 minutes, then you play for 30 minutes in wonderful interpersonal dynamics, then you got to close it out. Yeah. And uh, and television, that middle zone, is basically the whole thing. You get to live in that space that we love so much. And we've always described it as mining sort of like the epically small things that happen between characters. And and so for us, it, it just posthumously we sort of found out that the television form is potentially more suited to uh, our skill set and what we're interested in. Which doesn't mean you're not going to keep making movies, right? I mean, no, no, we have four movies going to Sundance. Not road directed. But yeah, like, how does, how does this kind of affect your working life? Because I get what you mean about the creative poverty, the tentativeness, that sort of thing. But then also, like, you have this TV show now. Like, that's some legitimacy and some stability for you guys. Mm -hmm. But, like, how, do you, how are you going to make the time? Like, you know, you've had long-standing relationships with other directors. It's definitely been an avalanche of creative 
output for me and Mark to, you know, it is, it is a lot of work to... Is it because you can't say no or because you just always have ideas and you want to make them We happen? say no all the we time. We say no so much it's unbelievable. Yeah. But, uh, e but, like, we're now at the point where, like, we're getting offered so much great stuff that it's like, even if we say no to 80% of it, the twenty percent that we do take is still. We say no to ninety nine percent of it. Yeah, that's and, yeah. And are you saying yes to things where it's like we can learn from this? Like this is going to make us better. Like this is going to be like another relationship that's part gonna, of it like, is being able to learn. Idea. Part of it is is when we feel like we absolutely have something to contribute that can't be contributed otherwise. I mean, we feel, I guess, somewhat of a moral obligation sometimes when we feel like we have a skill set that is very specific and we know how to get this done and do it right and help this person that we believe in. It's very, very hard for us yeah. to say no. That's and, where we get pulled. You know, a lot of the producing stuff that we're doing is not financially, it's not about that at all. It's really just about the fact that, like, we did struggle for so long. We feel so fortunate to be in this position, and we do want to give back, and it just makes us... And if you're able to do something... It's called survivor's guilt, basically. Yeah. Well, and if you're is. able to do something where they're going to allow someone like um, Steve Zizis to, like, you know, play a leading role, and like yeah. they're gonna roll with that, and you like believe in him. So, I mean, yeah. Was there anyone else like that? Is there anyone else where you've kind of surfaced them, and you've been kind of proud to see them build a career? It, it very simply happened with our friend Brian Poyser, who was like, uh, while we were making the movie Cyrus and first starting to make money, he's like, uh, I'm making this movie, I'm $5,000 short. I hate asking you this. And we were like, no, we're giving you the money immediately uh, because we know what it was like to not have that support. We never had that. And then that movie turned out great, and then we actually helped him with the edit, and we're like, hmm, this whole thing where we give people script notes and we help them with their edits and we give them a little money, I guess that's producing. I guess, yeah. I guess we're producers now. I mean, and it, it's funny because people ask us, when did you decide to produce? We never happened. decided. Yeah. It just happened. And the same and thing happened with Colin Trevorrow with Safety Not Guaranteed. Yeah. And it happened with Charlie McDowell with The One I Love. What was the relationship with Colin Trevorrow? You know, he, he brought us the script and he said, I love what you guys do. Is there anything you can do to help me out? And I love, I love your sensibility. Yeah. When you can't get your movie made for the amount of money you want it made for, then you come to us and we will get it made for you really cheaply. Or, and, yeah, and you can help them figure out how to make it cheaply yeah, too because yeah. you've done it. We, we know or, exactly Or we take some of the money we make on TV and we pay for it for them. And that's part of the greatness of like being in the position we're in now. And I mean, before that, I mean, Mark and I were very strictly writer-directors and it was like we would make a movie every year or two, which, uh, you know, is a very unifying and s simplified process. But when you produce stuff, you learn so much about other people's process. You get to meet different actors. You get to explore different ways. You get to take some chances and try some different things. I mean, you get to try out different crew members that you're excited about. And it's, it's fun for us. And it's, you know, it is hard to strike the balance, but, you know, it's, um, I don't know, it's what, I guess, keeps, keeps everything vital. So are you guys gonna make a sci-fi blockbuster next? We have actually, you'd be surprised the level of shit that people offer us sometimes mm -hmm. where we're like, what are you, we're so wrong for this, you know? But they read our names in the trades and like, oh, these guys are cool, we'll offer them this script, you know? I mean, not to be like, you know, um, Mr. Artist, but like, Anything that you are making in the film world above $5 million at this point is a commodity. And you owe it to them to make their money back and they will beat the living shit out of you and your script and your casting process until they get what they feel will make them money. And it's just a bummer. And it's not a place I want to make art. One last question, which is about like literally the next film you guys are making together. Uh, just, you know, I I'm just, Curious to know. It, it, it will be together in a season two. It'll yeah, be the next film. That is make. our next film. It, it it's taken us a long time to commit to doing a TV show because, you know, what we've learned in this process is that we are suited to TV, but we've also learned that we are not showrunners alone. We're willing to run a show so that we can write and direct it, but we don't want to be the pit bosses of a television. Well, show. that thing where like you write. And, and direct a pilot and then you just like go away and leave your name on it. We own this show. We write and direct every episode of this show, basically. And essentially, we're making two movies a year. I mean, we basically yeah. made two movies last year. It's a full-time job all year round and that is how we view it. It's together. very binge-watchable. Like, I think that that's part that's of the, great. the appeal of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, you guys. I really yeah. appreciate the time. Love oh, to meet thanks. you guys. Appreciate it, yeah.